Philadelphia, are you ready? <laughs> no, he said, are you ready? This is Brotherly Love Wrestling Podcast, your first stop for everything professional wrestling. So sit back and enjoy wrestling talk at its finest with your hosts, Larry Hall and Joe Corrado. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Brotherly Love Wrestling Podcast. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking... You guys have been dropping a lot of shit lately. That's because, you know what? It's the end of the year. It's the gift that we give to you. It's your New Year's present. Going into the New Year, this is how we want to set this trend. Interview. Interview. If they're interview. Some bullshit. Some bullshit. Interview. Interview. Bullshit. Bullshit. Do you got it? Bullshit. Bullshit. Interview. Interview. That's how we want it to go all year. <laughs> Ow. I just hit my hand. <laughs> and I mean, not necessarily. This is probably the beginning of the new year, depending on when they're listening to this. Obviously, what do you think they're going to listen to it in September? It's a what? The hell did you just say? <laughs> I said it's the beginning of the new year. Yeah, you said it's the end of the year. If this is being listened to on January second, it's no longer the end of the year. Oh, I see what I did there, and then you tried to throw me under the bus, <laughs> dickhead. <laughs> I'm just looking out for all the listeners. Condescending tones and trying to one-up me. You're a habitual (laughs) one-upper. Anyway. Back to the story. Yes. So. On today's show. Vince. Oh, I was going to tell a story. No. (laughs) Don't tell a story? No, we're we're supposed to announce who we have on today's show. Joining us on today's show, GCW announcer Kevin Gill. We talk all things GCW. And we sprinkle in a little bit of AEW, and we sprinkle in a little bit of what we think of some fan bases. Hey, you know what? No holds barred. Great wrestling movie, and we're going to apply it to this interview. Boom. Yeah, so Kevin Gill joins us. We hope you um, enjoy, and if you don't know about GCW Wrestling, you're you're about about, to. Yeah, you're about to find a lot out. So um, sit back and listen in. All right, on today's show, we have Kevin Gill joining us. Kevin, welcome to our show. It's great to be here, the city of brotherly love, the podcast of brotherly love, uh, celebrating the business, in a way, behind the scenes of brotherly love. Because outside of internet haters, never bees and wannabes and all that, there is the actual core of wrestling, which is driven by love, driven by creativity, driven by passion. And here we all are to uh, document and discuss how great is that. Shit, man. We didn't come as prepared as you. I love, I'm love. i an off-the-top-of-the-head guy. <laughs> Jesus, man. We need to uh, book you for our intros. Damn. Please, anytime. That was good. I'm, like, flabbergasted at the fact that, like, what? He came in, like, hot with a with an intro to our intro. <laughs> Just try to help, help paint the picture, man. You guys have the platform, and I appreciate it. Uh, you invited me on today to talk to everybody. You're the Bob Ross of fucking intros. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I, I'm, I, my art, uh, my medium is words, you know, written, spoken, whatever. Uh, you did it well. <laughs> now, thank to, you, man. To familiarize the people, and you showed off in the first thirty seconds of the show. Now we know you from commentary of Game Changer Wrestling, aka GCW. Amen. The hands down the the best independent promotion in the world right now i mean i don't i'm not aware of who else is doing it like them and i follow everything pretty closely <laughs> yeah much like us it's it's tough at times to actually watch or catch up on every single thing but some more than others have like really climbed to the top, whether it be the indies, mainly the indies, because there is really only one or two tops other than independent wrestling shows, and GCW is one of them at the top. Without a doubt, and, and you know, don't get me wrong, there's great independent promotions all around America, the United States, but when I when I make a, a statement like, oh, Game Changer Wrestling is the best promotion, I think that 
I'm taking I'm adding into effect that it's not just that they run a great show every month or every twice a month or or three times a month in one consolidated area. Their territory is huge chunks of the United States and Japan. And I, I think when you and the fact that the worldwide audience watches so closely, I think when you add those factors in and the talent, obviously, which is, you know, kind of the reason we're all there. It, it 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 makes a very compelling case. You know what I mean? Like Pro and Gorilla is incredible and it's obviously changed the game in many of its own ways, but it's it's completely different to run one show every few months in LA, I think, no matter how great it is, than it is to run you see the world as your territory. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And I mean correct me if I'm wrong, but G C W is known from maybe outsiders and insiders as more outlaws and not to not some mean it as derogatory but i think they take kindly to that like they kind of want to be outlaws am i wrong in saying that sure well i think it's a rebellious attitude you know when you think of the great things great changes that happened whether it be in video games whether it be in music whether it be in film or whether it be in professional wrestling All the great change and the great strides and the dramatic reinventions and the raising of the bars, it all happens when a spirit of rebellion is present, when people have passion and heart and they're not constrained or constricted by, you know, corporate parameters or or whatever it might be. I think you just end up with such a such a organic thing. To me, it's like it's unfuckwithable. You know what I mean? I like the word. Yeah, Un- we're definitely stealing that. <laughs> Unfuck with a bull. Please. Unfuck with a bull. So the the one of the major major But uh, questions... to to go on to go on sorry to fully answer your question though, I, I was kind of just uh alliterating your point about rebellion or you know the being an outlaw. But I think also Game Changer refers to themselves as the last outlaws because they have that spirit. You know what I mean? They're they have a rebellion spirit or rebellious spirit, and when you look at kind of everything else that's going on and you look at people who want to negatively use the word outlaw like it's something bad outlaws have always been cool outlaws have always been outside the box and unless you're a herb you know what i mean like you're always going to be down with the outlaws with the rebels the whatever if you're not you're kind of like a you know what i'm saying johnny lunch pail or Susie Susie ham and eggs or whatever the fuck you know what i mean It's like I always liked music that was edgy and and had reality to it. I like film the same way. I like video games the same way. Why wouldn't I like wrestling or or books or any other form of art the same way? I like it real, raw, hardcore reality. Now, playing off of that, now GCW has gotten a lot more mainstream recognition and a lot more popularity, so to speak. Now, how do they – how do they – deal with being get by by getting popular but also staying with their their outlaw mentality their their kind of like homegrown mentality i mean i I feel in my opinion i feel it's a matter of they're always trying to deliver the best possible show for their audience for their supporters and it sounds crazy in wrestling but not every company thinks giving the people what they want is good I don't know how they came up with this idea, but at Game Changer, I feel like listening to the audience, giving the audience what they want and meeting and exceeding the audience's expectations each time is is how you keep moving up the ladder, is how you keep changing the game. If you're worried about breaking some eggs, if you're worried about uh, stepping on a sponsor's toes, if you're worrying about your, you know, uh, whether you have a trust fund or whether you have some sort of a, a, a hedge fund. Uh, you know, kind of propping up your company. This is like a, a DIY thing. And that's what I love about it too, is that it's like, I used to put out uh, hardcore records, like uh, New York hardcore records, like a music genre from the underground uh, when I was a kid. And I was just one person and I would press the records and sell them and, you know what I mean? Find the bands and blah, blah, blah. And that spirit of DIY is, is lost sometimes in the modern age where everybody wants to, say they're signed or something, but nobody wants to say I'm independent. You know what I mean? I'm doing my own thing. And I think that game changer doesn't worry about the critics. Cause if you listen to every person with an egg, uh, an egg avatar on Twitter, 
and you know three followers and they formed their account a month ago exclusively to harass people mm-hmm. if you listen to them when you have your vision and your booking and your creative by trying to appeal to them you end up appealing to no one because they are no one they have no clout and your audience isn't in tune with them so i, I think game changer has that has that on lock of listening to the crowd listen to the reaction you know what i mean and let talent speak first the the talent of every wrestler there is what gets them on the show there's no match on game changer where it's a good time to go to the bathroom or go to the concession stand because the booker's friend has a match and the guy who brought the ring has a match and the dude who prints the flyers has a match you know what i mean no i I know exactly what you mean and as much as it's known for its death match mentality people i think look at that and that's what shies them away from maybe giving them a chance but what they don't realize is that they're missing out on they have a little bit of everything on their on their shows they have the the knockdown drag out brawl type matches the old slobber knocker mentality matches they have they have the the spotty matches the the flippy shit quote unquote yes they have their death matches as well with the with the various types of of weapons and whatnot but i think that they've gotten labeled as deathmatch wrestling, if people tend to to shy away from it more. Sure, sure, yeah. Like they, like uh, deathmatch wrestling could be seen as like a like a scourge or something that people are like, oh, uh, that that I don't want to be involved with that. But like you said, I agree, hundred percent. People are missing the point, I guess, in a sense, because game changer wrestling is professional wrestling, professional wrestling that everybody talks about. You know. Um, uh, like reminisces on how great professional wrestling was. Professional wrestling always had blood in it. It always had different body show. And I, I think Game Changer Wrestling gets that more than more than everybody. Uh, you know, and also let's be honest, some of the people who've tried to run with the deathmatch flag, so to speak, over the years and tried to do their best to promote deathmatch wrestling or events, not all of them did it with, you know, appropriate production, appropriate safeguards, appropriate talent considerations. You know what I mean? So it's one thing to watch two guys gig in front of the camera in front of 15 people, you know what I mean, and and seriously injure each other. That's an entirely different thing from seeing a G-Raver, you know what I mean, seeing a Nick Gage, seeing any of these people, uh, Marcus Crane, you know, seeing these people, or Schlack, seeing these people perform their art and doing their thing, it, it's it's fucking wild, man. And it, it's not like anything else. I think, you know, hey, if, you, if you're not into the blood and guts and the violence, I that that's your taste and your opinion. I, I respect that. And with that said, when Game Changer runs a show like Tournament of Survival or the Nick Age Invitational, that it's a deathmatch show, that would be a good show for you to probably skip unless you want to try something new. But on the flip side... The average Game Changer show, if you come see it in L.A. or Nashville or or wherever, you look at the card. You know what I mean? There might be some violence and blood on the card, but the overall show I don't feel like is a blood and gut show. It's just a state-of-the-art wrestling in-ring product. I will say this, just to – you're saying watch like the other shows, like the Nashville show. One of my – what I – one of my favorite matches that they've done recently was the Effie versus Mancer match where they did. Oh, yeah. It was tribute after tribute after tribute to <laughs> every shitty WCW stipulation there ever was. Like, that was pop after pop after pop after pop. And that's why I think people, they, they're missing out by not, um, by not, by just labeling them as one thing when that is so far from deathmatch it's not even funny right and that's the thing what's happening is people are labeling game changer and even other places and and performers without actual any knowledge or experience if you experience a product and or performer and you don't like it hey that's your opinion good for you but if you just listen to what some bitter miserable weirdo with an agenda or whatever or bitter old young doesn't matter um you're kind of really missing out on life. Like think for yourself, like instead of relying on someone else's opinion to be your filter, like it's okay to have your own thoughts, you know? Yeah. I mean, and the other thing is, and, and, and real quick, I'm sorry to step on you. 
people said everything that you just said that people say about Game Changer Wrestling, people used to say that about ECW Wrestling, despite the fact that on the same ECW show where you could see this crazy violence, you also saw a young Rey Mysterio, a young Eddie Guerrero, a young Mick Foley, like, uh, you know, I could go on and on. It, it's it's a, a misconception that only you miss out on. Yeah, like you're missing out on people who think that way. They miss out on this experience that is way different than they think. Yeah, Preconceived and notions, you know what I mean, are better off left aside. Contributing to that, I mean, at that point is at Halloween Fuckfest that was here in Philly, you had Swan versus Alex Zane, and they absolutely tore the house down. It was an amazing match. Oh. And you had the big spot where Zane jumps off the balcony – and does a swanton on the on the um, swan, and uh, but I mean it was just a crazy <laughs> match, and that type of match people who are stereotyping the company are missing out on because it was so great and especially in person, it was even better. But it's so good and it it's bad that people will do that and miss out. Yeah, because but the actual show itself, you know what I mean? Like again, you know, there's. A lot of great independents out there, and a lot of them are featured as part of the collective that's going down WrestleMania weekend in in Florida. And it's like, yeah, man, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I started thinking about the collective for a second. (laughs) I forgot where I was going with that one. But, yeah, the point that people are missing out because, dude, anytime you can see a performer like Alex Zane, look at what's happened for for the – I don't know if there'll be people listening to this that are like uh, have closed minds against GCW or maybe listening to this. If they are and they think that Game Changer Wrestling has no fan base and no influence and no uh, no any of that. Keep in mind that Alex Zane wrestles on one Game Changer Wrestling show that was like a genre bending backyard wrestling show of all things. And from a series of gifts from his breakout performance in that match. Everyone from from Will Ospreay to uh, Sema to all these people were fully then on his radar, or he was on their radar. Mm-hmm. He was suddenly booked internationally. He's him and Alex, uh, him and um, uh, my bad, Blake Christian started wrestling for Pro Wrestling Gorilla. I mean, that's colossal. Like that's a. It used to be that a wrestler like a a, a Jacob Fatu or a Jeff Cobb or a Tim Thatcher would grind for years and years and years hoping to someday maybe get to wrestle a pro wrestling gorilla and the platform and the audience support and the talent of game changer is, is fast tracking people who were that damn good that they can skip all the unpleasantries and get right to the fucking top of the business. You know what I mean? Of the independent scene. And when you're on top of the independent scene, it usually means it's not long before you're either accepting or turning down or renegotiating offers from from bigger entities. Yeah, I I got sidetracked there too. <laughs> <laughs> I just listened to you talk. I don't know which way I was going next, but yeah, it, it's it's absolutely crazy the way that GCW operates. It's almost like they they really want to grow, but they want to do it by their own standards. They want to do it on their own terms. Does that make sense? Uh, I I think it does. You know, I've gotten to work with a lot of different wrestling companies and and non-wrestling companies over the years. And every business has or every team has people in it that get it and don't get it and et cetera. Um, And you learn from all of them. But what I see with Game Changer for what they're able to do with the amount of people, so to speak, that they have, you know, it's not exactly – you know, it's not like they have a team. They don't have a, a giant office or and there's no one paying the bills or laying out the money or or anything like that. So it's, it's a totally DIY thing. And, yeah, I, I think it's like all indie promoters. It's all DIY for the most part, the truly independence. But that's also why most of those companies, as dope as some of them are, choose to run within 60 miles or 90 miles or even just within their town. Because that's a cool last thing, too, to have a cool monthly event. You know what I mean? But, yeah, I think just Game Changer takes it. Just the idea, like, it, it blows my mind that they – Game Changer ran multiple sold-out shows in Japan in August of 2019 and have already just about sold out 
three nights in Tokyo for a return in February 2020. That's fucking insane. Like, I don't can. Is there one American wrestling company that has done that? Period. And then add to that on their own. Absolutely fucking not. No, I was. Uh, and and that's that's like, it, you know what I mean. To me, that's making moves on a level beyond the traditional or beyond the norm. You know what I mean. And that's all because of. And the- to see the the fans. And to see the fans' uh, reaction, like the the way the fans are at Game Changer events, and, you know, this sounds like, uh, you know, something that everybody wants to pretend that their audience is a family and et cetera, but you go to these Game Changer shows and it's really, it's it's a very unique um, just formation of people, like all races, all, all places, faces, all of it. Some people are super fucking high, like crazy high, eating edibles during the show. Some people are straight edge. You know what I mean? Some people love to drink. Some people just love the wrestling. Like, but they come, they travel, they fly in from different places. Like they know they're part of something. They're, and that ticket, that pay per view buy, that DVD buy, Blu ray buy, t shirt buy, whatever, all of that brings the show back. You know what I mean? So, it, it's it's a wonderful thing that if you deliver a high end product in 2019 and you give the audience what they want and don't insult their intelligence or false advertise to them or or any of the other pitfalls that many people fall into, that you can have like a sustainable ecosystem where they can just be like, oh, we're running Austin next, we're running uh, Detroit, Michigan next, we're running Tokyo like that. That to me is is uh, a huge, huge, huge outside the box accomplishment, and it leads to because think of it, we get to be here in it and around it. There's people that aren't even aware of Game Changer Wrestling at this moment, but in two years, in eighteen months, in six months, they might have their own company that you tries to utilize a lot of the principles or concepts of Game Changer Wrestling. And then where will it be five years from now, ten years from now? You know what I mean? It's I, I think the influence is is large, but the influence is also growing because for as many people have their finger to the pulse and know what's up, there's a lot, a lot of people that don't know. But thankfully, there's a lot of people who don't understand what they're seeing. Some of them work for the biggest wrestling company in the world, and they continually retweet out these matches to say that they're bad, which is like, thank you for spreading these matches to out of your millions of followers. What percentage of them do you think think they're bad, and what percentage of them are like, holy shit, how come you can't wrestle like that? Well, you, you, <laughs> you know know touched I mean? on it. So <laughs> you touched on it. We're not going to beat around the bush. Now, I know I know what you're referencing to, and I think that there's probably a lot of people out there that know what you're referencing to. In a particular, happened, what, two days ago? But the actual match happened the day after Christmas, and that was Blake Christian versus Jordan Oliver. And all that was put out was a... <clears throat> Maybe 50 second clip of uh, what called spots, quote unquote. Yeah, but like the opening, like kind of the opening exchange, if you the will. The opening sequence of a match, which just happened to be a lot of, I don't know why it was perceived as just dance, whatever the fuck it was, but it was actually evasive movement to try and get away from each other in different creative aspects yeah. of uh, of wrestling. Um, yeah, of what, a, mil- a million percent of what we perceive as wrestling, but others don't perceive as wrestling. Now, the people that you're talking about, I won't name drop, but some higher up juggernaut company officials and coaches and whatnot decided that they wanted to jump in on this. And even some of the talent as well and pretty much cast a shadow over the indie promotion that is GCW and in particular Jordan Oliver and Blake Christian who happen to be two of the yeah. top names in the indies right now. Yeah. Which is a really interesting thing to do. Like I said, because on one hand uh, they are, you know, in a sense insulting or mocking or whatever the appropriate word is for each of the different tweets and things that were sent out from these performers or coaches, but they kind of go in that direction with it. And uh, it's like, oh, sorry. I'm trying, I just, I got lost in my thoughts again. Not a problem. Uh, it's, it's, sorry, ask me the question again. 
please. Now you want me to go back in my brain and try and rethink of what I just said? I'm or just like the, the kind of the final, the final, the it final. was the, uh, okay, so well, on one hand, they're saying the insulting or mocking or whatever it might be, critical but not in a constructive or helpful way. Correct. Or so the, And without seeing the whole match or seeing it in context or whatever, or uh, pro, uh, incorporating the audience reaction, critics' reactions, etc., um, on the flip side, they're exposing an amazingly revolutionary style of wrestling, which was one match on a great show of all different styles of matches. Um, they're exposing that to millions and millions and millions of people, which is cool. For that, I say thank you, you know. Um, I would love it if everyone who wants to take the time to try to dunk on someone who they perceive to be lower than them and people who are lower than them in terms of uh, finances, in terms of uh, fame, etc. It's very easy to dunk on someone who's in the underground, you know what I mean? It's also just as easy in the modern age to send said talent uh, a DM, to contact said talent via uh, underground talent via any means and give them criticism, give them advice, tell them what you liked and didn't like, tell them what you think could be better. That's like way more productive. But at the same time, of all the people, say, uh, who've said negative stuff, who work at big wrestling companies – what about a dude like Ricochet, who's one of the most revolutionary wrestlers of our time, like a physical freak in terms of what he can do, a guy who's so fucking good that, you know, WWE and them couldn't be without him because he's that fucking good. He tweeted out a praise to those guys. You know what I mean? And so did Will fucking Osprey. And when you think of Will Osprey and Ricochet, they had a series of monumental, mind-blowing, game-changing, pun intended, matches. And pe the same people got enraged, allegedly, you know what I mean, at this match and said they were danced, said a lot of the same stupid things. But I didn't think Ricochet and Will Ospreay looked stupid when they did that stuff. They looked amazing. And people who never watched wrestling before saw that stuff on social media some fans got into New Japan and got into other stuff just because they saw those amazing athletes doing what they do best. No one got married or divorced. No one ate fucking dog food. But physically, the wrestlers wrestled. <laughs> and the people like wrestling, even if they don't know it yet. Now, so those are kind of – that's yeah. kind of a rant for you. No, no, that's fine. I'm going to I'm gonna hopefully add to it with some – sort of common but anyway yeah it, it's nice to see that the uh where you got some of the bad with the good where you got the tear down but you also got the build up but i wanted to double back and touch on how you said that the the vets or the the talent could have dm'd uh blake or jordan to give them constructive criticism but unfortunately that's not the way that wrestling really works if i I'm wrong, please correct me, but it's usually not the vet that will reach out to the younger guy. It's they want them to reach out to them because I saw a lot of people saying, well, if they would have came to me directly and asked for some criticism, I would have happily given it to them. But they didn't really give them the opportunity right. to do that to begin with. They kind of tore it down before they even – like what were they supposed to do? Go to everybody and be like – well, hey, am I doing this right? Can you t give me any pointers and go to everybody in the fucking world to ask them for pointers? Right, because that's how wrestling works. You know, you're you're 100 percent right about that. And the reason I bring up these vets and and icons, legends, top paid performers, the reason I mention them specifically contacting the the performers like we're talking about, is because they can in two seconds contact the per the people we're talking about yeah. for Blake Christian to maybe get in touch with uh, Randy Orton or whatever. That might not be something that Blake Christian could easily do at the snap of a finger, not to say he couldn't do it in short term, but you know what I mean? On the flip side, He's Randy Orton it. follows the dude on Twitter and then, then you're done. And then you inbox him. You might even have to not even have to follow Blake Christian to inbox him. I don't know, but either way, you know what I'm saying? If you saw Randy Orton just followed you, if you didn't follow him already, you would probably follow him back. Yeah, he's probably one of those guys that you're like, holy fuck. He's like one of the the so, top 
top dog, so to speak. But I mean, for sure, and, and from a wrestling family. But think about it: all throughout wrestling, the greatest example. Uh, there's many great examples, but one of the greatest examples ever is I was it uh, is it Luthez who uh, said that Harley Race was destroying the business with his unrealistic dives off the top rope and no. Am I, or am I, am I mixing up Luthez with someone else? I think you're right. I'm actually the most popular. I don't want to misspeak. Right. No, that's all right. We I misspeak so, all the time. We'll think about it. So uh, a top, top legendary wrestler like Dez, if I'm correctly attributing the quote, it was someone of his stature, um, shitting on Harley Race publicly for doing his top rope headbutt and saying that it exposed the business, it would kill the business, that he, he looked like a, um, uh, he used the word uh, kamikaze. Like, a, 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 you know what I'm saying? Just opening a whole thing. And at the end of the day, Luthez, respected legend, hands down, right? But at the same time, if you talked to a hundred or a thousand or whatever number of wrestling fans, of the modern age uh, and younger, all the current top guys in WWE and their previous generation. What is the consensus on Harley Race? Harley Race is a worker's worker. He's a legendary tough guy. He's all these great things. He's old school as it fucking gets. But there's always someone whose head is so twisted and for whatever reason, bitter, miserable, unfulfilled, or maybe something else. Who knows? But for whatever reason, they're not content with their own legacy, and they have to lash out and shit on other people. And it's one thing if you just see some guy who can't wrestle climb up a building and fall off of it, so to speak, and you kind of dunk on that or laugh at that. I could, I could understand that a little bit more because you look at it as like, well, these guys aren't even wrestlers. But when you look at guys like Blake Christian and Jordan Oliver – and how fast they're rising, there's no doubt those kids love their craft. They're not new to wrestling. They didn't get into it because they thought uh, modeling or football wasn't working out. They mm. fucking love it, and they're already rising to the top. So to me, they're an entirely different entity than something you can just dismiss. But uh, closed-minded people – and again, in this case, closed-minded people I think are more of the – the clownette fans and stuff on social media, uh, you know, like the, con the contracted talents and coaches and stuff, they, they may not be fully aware. It's kind of just Twitter points, you know what I mean? And I, I don't know if they really think about the ramifications, but you know what I'm saying? Well, here, and the impact, you know, because... I, I got a scenario for you. Now, do you, you think that, like you brought up uh, Thez and Harley Race saying that he was a... Uh, a clown or a kamikaze for coming off the top rope. And now if you fast forward to today, do you think that the older generation is just trying to protect their, their quote unquote wrestling? Because if it evolves anymore, they won't be able to keep up. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's, it's just like, it, I, I look at music as an example. You know what I mean? Look how many forms of, metal there are you know what i mean in, ter in terms of like grindcore power metal sludge like there's so many forms of metal right and at the top of heavy metal is metal you know as far as dollars or whatever you have metallica yeah. is metallica mad that napalm death exists is metallica mad that um some other extreme form of doom metal from uh the norwegian islands fucking exists no they're fucking metallica they're doing the top they're in the top echelon of the game and if someone's doing some crazy underground shit that's in the metal vein, that's like cool for metal, cool for art, cool for expression. I don't even like fucking Metallica. Do you know what I mean? But I'm just using them as an example. And it's weird that if certain people or maybe it's social media that makes certain people this way, that when people are in the same position, they feel like they have to shit on, on stuff in the underground or stuff on the rise. You know, go shit on if you know if Starbucks or some corporate entity is exploiting wrestling or exploiting wrestlers. Go shit on them, but don't shit on young talent that is giving it their all and is supremely talented. And you you know it as well as I know it that probably within the next twelve months, both of those guys are going to be on television somewhere. So who's laughing then? Them. You know what I mean? The talent.
Yeah, I, I know firsthand that there's not many people that get a genuine reaction quite like Jordan Oliver right now. Just it's by, beautiful, man. Like, he's a heel. He walks out and is just and I, unanimously despised by an entire crowd. I don't even like to talk nice about him because I like to just keep it on the show. You know what I mean? And just talk about what a piece of shit he is. Yeah. But as a wrestler, man, you can't fuck with that dude. And like you said, the heat. In an era where to be heels, people either have to wear sports costumes from another city or do whatever hokey shit that you have to do as a heel because on one hand you can't offend anyone on the, and on the other hand some people don't have any creative ideas. But his – he just exudes like you want to see someone beat him up. You know what I mean? And, and he's – I think he's he's an outstanding talent and, and I think you know, obviously like his work speaks for itself just like Blake Christian. They're both outstanding in, in totally unique ways and – I don't know. I think at the end of the day, if I had a bet, if they were stock, I would buy stock on those people because they're they're going nowhere but up because they're that good. And I wouldn't be proud of myself as someone who's an expert on not saying I'm an expert on wrestling. But if I was someone in a top company that saw myself as an expert in wrestling, I would feel foolish to be publicly shitting on stuff that probably in a year or two, they're going to be my coworkers or my competition. Yeah, I mean, and you know what? The it first... just shows that you don't, don't understand the game. And to go back to what you said, do I think they want to, in general, the people want to protect their style of wrestling or what they had. What you have in your style is your style. Celebrate it. Live it. Love it. But that's like my kind of Metallica example is that it all, it all moves forward. It all evolves. What you like the best, that's awesome. You know, you might go to Taco Bell and love the basic Taco Bell taco, and that's what you get. That's awesome. But are you going to go online and talk about, oh, these motherfuckers come in there with their crunch wrap supreme. <laughs> I'm talking about regular tacos, bro. The real shit. You know what I mean? You kind of sound like an idiot because you could go off about – you could cut a fun promo about why you prefer one over the other or you, you, know, you keep it OG, analog tapes and Taco Bell tacos only. But at the same time, in a way, you kind of miss out on cool stuff because – your mind is closed, you know, <laughs> and you're not. Ah. Yeah, it's fascinating to me, man. I can go on for fucking hours on this topic. You, you systematically brought Adam Z or Alex Zane back into the, uh, the the conversation with tacos. <laughs> yeah, and see, look at that uh, 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 inadvertent transition. So well, the one thing that we that we wanted to talk to you about that's been on our mind for a while because. In our area, you have CZW in, in Voorhees that we've gone to um, at least a handful of events, maybe more. Um, we see this, uh, I don't even know what to call it, whether it's a beef or whatever. The the deal with CZW and Game Changer Wrestling and where everything has gone and how Ricky Shane Page and a lot of wrestlers from CZW are now with uh, GCW we're just very confused on where that whole storyline is and where where everything started. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's the thing is that, you know, as far as I'm aware, like there is no storyline per se. There's just, I guess, uh, two separate entities that do business completely separately and there's no – the the streams don't mix, so to speak. You know what I mean? And uh, the, the history of, of Game Changer Wrestling with CZW – uh, predates my time in Game Changer Wrestling, but I know that, uh, like it is what it is, so to speak. Like I, I think that Game Changer, you know, we took we've been talking for a while about what a revolutionary force it is, and uh, I don't know if that rubs certain people the wrong way or, or you know what I mean. But yeah, they they to me, yeah, it's not like a storyline or anything like that. It's just something that. Uh, the talent, I guess, chooses where to work. And at this time, um, comp some companies seem to ebb and flow or rise and, and, and sink a little bit like the tide. And um, I don't think it would be uh, – I'm not trying to be disrespectful when I say that as we speak in December of uh, – late December 2019, uh, Combat Zone Wrestling is not in the same place in the market within the brand perception, uh, et cetera, that they were – uh, a handful of years ago. Do you know what I mean? And I think Game Changer Wrestling is a very white-hot entity 
uh, in the same space, but has already transcended, you know, the New Jersey or Philadelphia area exclusively, although those are hotbed cities, you know what I mean? So it seems like there's just fundamental um, business differences between the parties, and uh, I'm not fully sure, like, the entire origination of it, but... Yeah, like the audience, the audience, see, if I, I can speak about that uh, from a firsthand experience, like the audience loves yelling out, like, you know what I'm saying? They call Jordan Oliver DJ's bitch, you know what I mean? And yeah. and they yell out a, lo- a lot of stuff that's like, holy fuck, you know what I mean? Like, so in other words, it, it's like uh, two separate companies that are rivals, I guess, but the audience takes it personally, in a sense, like their brand, it's, you know, Game Changer is their flag. And some of them started being wrestling fans were game changer. Some of them, uh, I think, were were combat zone fans that, you know, decided that maybe they didn't want to go to combat zone anymore. And some people, I'm sure, go to go to all the shows. They go to as many shows as they can, whether it's combat zone or or game changer. You know what I mean? But it's one of those things that uh, it, it's an interesting time. You know, again, we see uh, some companies are, and it's not just game changer. Uh, some companies are just moving and growing and expanding or maintaining it. And we've seen more than one company, um, struggle in 2019. You know what I mean? So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what, what 2020 brings for, for CZW and, and for other companies and for Game Changer, you know? Speaking of other companies, I wanted to touch on one more because we were talking about, Fan bases and one in particular fan base for one in particular company being AEW and how some of the fan base could be, I don't know, perceived as ruining it for everybody else. What do you mean by ruining it? Not not so much ruining the product, but making it seem like, ah, what's the word I'm looking for? Overhyping it for the sake of overhyping it, just to oh, right, like, yeah, kind of like the uh, like uh, Sony versus Microsoft sort of like beef, but between AEW and WWE fans, like that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, like, the, the fan like uh, tribalism. Yeah, like the fan bases on both sides, like just they put up these imaginary flags for some reason and started this. I know, quote unquote, it's a war or whatnot. It's not really a war right now because. It's not nearly at the numbers as it was back with the actual Monday Night Wars, but it seems like it's gotten a lot more petty, and I know that's mainly because of social media and whatnot, but it seems like fans don't know how to be quote-unquote fans anymore. They, they're they more uh, infatuated with the fact that they want this business to succeed even though they don't have a, a, a horse in the race. Yeah, well, and it's weird. I, I find I look at it that I, I see what you're saying, and then I also think of it as I also see a lot of people who want AEW to fail, who want WWE to fail, who want whatever company to fail, and, and that that's such a strange um, like the wanting companies to fail thing is a weird thing. The hyping companies up, like I, I can get it, I can get it to an extent, but I try to just live my life by the philosophy of you know there's only so many hours in the fucking week. And fortunately and fortunately, there's now too much wrestling in a sense. Like you can't even hope to watch it, watch it all, you know. So to me, I just try to watch and enjoy the stuff that I like. And I wish more people could subscribe to this philosophy. And I try to spend as little time as possible thinking about or discussing things that I don't like. And it sounds dumb or simple, but – your life gets a lot better. You know what I mean? So, hey, WWE has a three-hour show on one night and a two-hour show on another night and an hour show on another night and a talk show on another night and et cetera, et cetera. And then AEW has a two-hour show and a one-hour show. And, you know, that that's a lot, a lot of hours. But if I just enjoy the parts that I enjoy and seek out segments or epi- certain episodes or whatever – and if I hear something's whack or it seems like not a good week to watch, I don't know. It's like by just focusing on what you like and kind of generally being supportive of wrestling, the whole industry grows. The other thing that I think is so important to note is that 
the online tone, so to speak, like the temp, if you take the temperature of Twitter in terms of all the endless shit they're hating on about wrestling, and then you go to any live wrestling event by any company for all this venom and shit and whatever that you would think that it's like, oh God, when this wrestler comes out, like everyone's going to just turn their back or people will throw garbage at the ring or this or whatever it, it might be. And you just go there and everyone at the show loves wrestling. And if they go to a good show like Game Changer or Gorilla or AEW or whatever, they're going to fucking see great, great matches. They're going to pop all fucking night. What's there to be mad about? You know what I mean? It's like a weird – the whole being angry about everything. And I – listen, I get being uh, – we live in a world that's pretty fucked up. So there are real things to be angry about or upset about, and there are things that come up that people want to lend their voice to certain causes or you know, to right certain wrongs and all that. Yes, please do that often. But I, I think people get so caught up in – in sh like just shitting on everything and it's like what is your life you know what i mean like it's just it's just so weird and you have like reporters like guys who are supposed to be accredited professional reporters and they're like fighting with other reporters on social media in front of everybody and it's like do you remember the time that dan rather started fighting with walter cronkite about you know who found out someone you know didn't need catering or whatever no because that never fucking <laughs> happened. You know what I mean? I thought you were going to say it's like, just yeah. kinda, it's so strange in a way. <laughs> no, no, I like, I, I completely agree. It's like, I love, you know, I love outlaws and, and, you know, DIY rough around the edges, all that. But I, within, you can have all that and you can have professionalism and you can kind of protect your brand and, and it's just realized that I don't know why more people don't have self-awareness or just realize that the more you do that stuff on social media, the more you don't look good. Even if you might be right about what you're saying, you have to kind of p pick your spots. That's my – I literally every day I look at social media and see someone who makes more money than me uh, saying something on Twitter that or Facebook that in the long run will cost them money. That I'm like, I wish I could be advising these people or helping them or giving them like a, a social media coaching seminar to be like, look, dude, these are a few good things not to do, dude or do that, you know? Absolutely. So, uh, Kev, we want to thank you so much for coming on and taking the time to talk to us. And uh, we really appreciate everything uh, you were talking to us about. And, um, and picking your brain on everything gcw and anything that surrounds gcw yes so uh we hope uh, yeah, man, we yeah. eventually can talk to you uh, again soon well i would love to do it i'm honored you guys have me on i appreciate it a lot as you could tell i'm passionate about pro wrestling i'm passionate about game changer and uh being able to just uh, kind of shoot from the heart about it you know what i mean especially here at the holiday season you know fully open mind open eyes open trying to take it all in and and uh I'm looking forward to a great 2020 and uh, Game Changer has a lot of great shows in July and uh, January. I'm sorry on uh, Fight TV via Smart Mark Home Video. So I hope you guys and all the listeners are checking those out. And uh, I'm sure there'll be some announcements in the near future regarding the Japanese shows and and their availability. And uh, I do a podcast called The Kevin Gill Show. Um, I haven't released the episode in a minute, but I record in-person interviews with all kinds of wrestling and music luminaries. And uh, I'm a, and they're always recorded face to face in person in the same room. So uh, the next one I'm about to release is with Jake Atlas, uh, a standout game changer wrestling performer who's also well known from other places now, and a guy who's going a lot of places similar to what you know, uh, similar to what we've been talking about the whole show. So I encourage everyone to check out the Kevin Gill Show, please, on iTunes and Audio Boom. Peep that back catalog; it runs deep. And uh, support Game Changer, support the Indies, and Support positive mental attitude. Let a little love, a little light, a little hope into your life. If you don't like something, try to, like, just minimize it. Minimize it like the window on your fucking browser. You know what I mean? <laughs> and expand the view of what you dig. And just do it for a few hours a day, and your life will get better. Take it from me, your boy KG. Much love, and thanks for having me. Shout me out on Twitter, too, at OG Kevin Gill. And uh, Instagram is the same. 
and Facebook, blah, blah, blah. Much love, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Have a good one. Peace. And there you have it, interview with Kevin Gill. I mean, pretty much an interview where we didn't really have to do much. No. We just throw out a couple of topic questions. We let Kev go off. Yeah, and that he did. And he did, and makes our job a lot easier because, you know what, we don't know all the ins and outs of GCW and how, I mean, we've been to the shows. We know what kind of product they put on and the crowd that goes to that those shows and the people that enjoy it. But it's nice to find out someone that's got a little bit more, more knowledge than we do about something that we love. Yeah, absolutely. And give us a little bit of an insight to that company. And not only that, the talent that they have, that maybe not a lot of people see that talent. And hopefully if you're listening to this, you can, if you haven't already, watch GCW and see the talent on that roster that they, they are putting out. They catch a well here here it's a it's a double edged sword. Mm-hmm. They catch a bad rap because they're known as the deathmatch uh promotion. But they also have a die hard fan base that will fucking ride or die with them. So they have to walk a fine line to get new uh new eyes on the product, so it's not all it's hard. It's a hard line to walk because it's not all deathmatch, but they're portrayed as the deathmatch. And it's hard to look past that, I guess, for some people that don't really like the blood and guts. Yeah, well, because it's not stands, really guts. Maybe no, sometimes. But it stands out. That's the most obvious thing. And it's the thing that will really... They're really... They're really gaining a lot of ground. Yeah, in absolutely. The whole independent scene. I mean, there's only maybe one or two that maybe do a little bit more than they do. Yeah. Popularity wise, but not they're right there. They're at the top. Yeah, absolutely. And like he said, the places that they're already going. Yeah. In the new year. And the names that they have on their shows regularly. Yeah. Are the top names in the whole indie scene. And like he said, if you're at an event and you're watching this there really is no bathroom break match, no. quote unquote. Like it's just you don't want to miss any match. No, but you get an intermission, so you go piss then. True, or you piss your pants. Well, uh, I would like you to use option one. Yeah, I agree. The bathroom. Yes, but if it happens, it happens. It's a wrestling show. We don't smell good anyway, right, people? That, right, people? That, we don't smell good at all. That's the stereotype. That is the stereotype. So more pissing on the pants, maybe. <laughs> maybe we all go to a show, we piss ourselves. You're not cool unless, unless you, you piss your, your pants. pants. Exactly. And on that note, thank you for listening. Hopefully you learned a little something about GCW. Hopefully you'll order their next pay-per-view if you're not going to be there live in attendance on Fight TV. And maybe... Just maybe we'll drop another episode sometime in this week with a year-end wrap-up type shenanigans. Who knows? We might. We're that crazy. Nah, we're just fucked up. (laughs) We hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll be talking to you very soon. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New... You can say Happy New Year until, like, August, I think. I don't think that long. That's not a thing? No. Uh Uh-uh. So... I've been doing it wrong this whole time. This whole time. Later.